Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session. Excellent. So before we start the session, I would like to uh, make a small um, announcement that is the contents expressed in this webinar are intended for educational purposes only and do not replace independent professional judgment. Statements of fact and opinions expressed are those of presenter individually and are not the opinion of or position of the organization the presenter works for. With this, um, let us get started on today's session. Uh, which is zero trust privacy, which means enforcing, reinforcing data protection in the AI era. I'm Smita Sriharsha. Uh, I'm a senior manager of platform security. I work for FI Networks. I'm pleased to be a presenter of this session and lovely to meet you all this morning. How are you all doing today? Okay, please feel free to use the emojis, use the, um, you know, um, chat as much as possible. I will, I will make this uh, as lively as possible for you. Feel free to ask questions. We will, uh, I will try to answer them as much as possible. All right, let's get rolling. So today's session is going to be a combination of concepts of zero trust privacy and data protection. And I will make this relevant to the AI era that we live in today. So with that, let us start with the overview. So what is happening today? So it is rapidly evolving. Today, the landscape is huge with the advancement of AI and we have data being the lifeblood of innovation and advancement. And also some people say that data is the new black or data is the new gold, ladies. So why are we saying that? Why is the data new gold? Well, let us figure it out together. So a lot of things are happening and the lifeblood of AI is data. So as much as data we feed to the AI, that much efficient AI is going to be. And that is going to increase the innovation. It's going to advance the technologies around us. Now, the current session that I am talking about delves around the paradigm of zero trust privacy. Now, why is privacy coming into picture? Because the data we are talking about has all our data, your data, my data, so that's why it is important. That's why the privacy is coming into picture as well. Now, today's session is going to help you understand why zero trust privacy is going to be helping us in the coming days in safeguarding the sensitive information that is being used by AI-driven ecosystems. So that is the topic of the day. Now, I would like you to look at the below table and see the number of data breaches that have happened from January 2024. From past five months, we have seen at least a dozen of massive data breaches with big giants like JP Morgan, Dropbox, Dell, US government, Giant Tiger, who is a retail store apparel um, store, Roku, which is like a streaming partner, and Bank of America, Anthropic. So Anthropic is a startup based on ChatGPT, Trello, Victoria Code system. That is just the beginning. Now, before this, last year, there were a lot of regulations that came into picture. So India had, we had our own DPDP Act that was announced and other countries also started, you know, rolling out their own regulations around data privacy and protection. So as we started seeing a lot of launch of these regulations and in line with that, what we're seeing today is a lot of data breaches happening. 
cyber crime is on the raise as usual and we are also seeing a lot of deep fakes coming in so our land landscape has become very 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 difficult with the ai advancements now let's see how uh, this has an impact on how we see things how we solve problems and what is an effect on the cyber security field in general in order to do that i would like to give you a brief history of ai and what ai is and what it can do and how it is going to look like in the future to understand that we need to understand the definition of ai so what is artificial intelligence it is the intelligence of machines or software as opposed to the intelligence of humans or animals so this is a textbook definition of ai now what it also means is that ai is built out of machines and software and it is used to imitate or replicate the intelligence of humans or animals now what it means is ai is trying to ease some of the functions complex computations and complex tasks that are done by the human beings in order to enable the mankind so the intent here is to enable the mankind so with that context i would put ai in the category of a tool okay so just like how google came and changed the world ai has come and it is going to change the world okay so please do consider it like any other technology or tool um, that has come to help us now let's look at the evolution of ai so earlier it was not called it was called classical ai ml mainly from what i was hearing it was only machine learning nobody used the word ai at that time like before 2005 so before 2005 it was taught in schools and colleges um so there were there were machine learning programs there were machine learning things but up until 20 2005 classical ai was not embraced by everybody it was only research people who were using these terms who were using these algorithms there was no data from the real world that was shared with these this community also they ran on few hundreds of examples very handful of examples with limited data sets so there was a very big paranoia around ai ml and it was not embraced now what changed the things was deep learning deep learning was started as initiative with by handful of companies and they started applying classical ai ml concepts at web scale not at a public scale but very very small scale with limited number of use cases and limited uh, constrained data sets so it was not really as massive as what you see today so the deep learning had the i would say the backbone it became the backbone of what we call it today as gen ai so the gen ai today is massive as you have seen from 2023 chat gpt becoming massive success now you can see that there is a huge explosion of number of Uh, companies using ai a number of companies starting up with solutions with the ai backbone and lot of innovation lot of uh, progress lot of um, movement around ai today now what this means to us is the way we did security the way we looked at solutions what the way we looked at building solutions has to change with this advancement now let us look at few examples i have tried to take examples from all the um, existing uh, industries so that we can relate to those industries and understand the impact of ai on the way we operate today the way we do security the way we do data privacy and protection today 
Now let's look at some of the examples or po popular AI use cases that we have today. So we have voice assistants, chatbots, and conversational AI. Now this is part of every household. This is part of every smartphone. We have Alexa, we have Siri, we have everything. We have Google Homes, without which we don't know how to operate sometimes. So we don't want to search through the songs. We want Alexa to pick the songs for us, or we want Google Home to decide what song we need to listen to. So that's the that's the example which is which does not require explanation. These are logging our conversations. These devices are learning from us. They are learning conversation from us. They are le learning Indian languages, like how we speak, the way in which with the dialect we speak, everything they understand. So I think conversational AI is very, very mature at this point of time we live in. The next example I would like to give you is personalization. So we get personalized ads, we get personalized suggestions on what we want to buy, what clothes we should buy, what should be accessorized with. All these is an outcome of AI. What is happening is AI is learning everything that we do and then suggesting us things that we should be looking at or we, we want to buy. Everything is being uh, driven by AI. Now, the third example is financial reporting and accounting. All the complex financial accounting problems are being solved by AI today. This would in, include credit reporting, this would include risk assessments. So these are the final uh, financial use cases that are being used by big giants, financial giants today. I don't want to name those giants, um, but these are big banking companies who are leveraging AI, including their, their cyber, like their cybersecurity is also AI driven. That is how advanced today is. Now, let's look at IT operations. Now, IT operations is enabled by AI systems. Most of the companies, I would say 80% of today's IT operations is driven by AI. Last but not the least, HR sector is not left alone. So all the hiring, recruiting, everything goes to eight years today, which is nothing but AI ML driven, algorithm driven, uh, software systems that we use. So what it means is all this massive data that is available out there with these AI use cases, technologies and, and companies that has massive data and that can have your data and my data as well as we speak. So now data being the cornerstone of everything and our data, like any data that is that can be identified, used to identify individual directly or in, indirectly, is PII data. And some data is sensitive data. For example, my financial information is sensitive data. Or in the recruiting, we have date of birth and uh, all the personal information that you have in the CV is is PII data. And that is out there and that is available to AI, right? So this is the era we are living in. So where we need to understand the importance of data and how should we protect it? What are the techniques that we can use to protect the data? With that foundation, let us understand what is zero trust and why is it relevant? Now that we understand the cornerstone of data and the AI that has complicated everything, let us look at the zero trust principles. Now, I have picked the Forrester representation of zero trust because it puts the data at the heart and center of everything. Data is a lifeblood, data is a heart and soul of everything we do today. Now, why? Because people use data, Devices use data, networks use data, workloads use data, irrespective of where they are. So everything is in and around data, including AI. Now, let us look at some of the foundational principles of zero trust. 
Zero trust is a principle. So it's not a solution sold by companies. Though some companies fulfill all these seven requirements and provide solutions, as such, zero trust architecture is a, is a principle. These are, these are foundational principles of how we should do security, how we should build systems in this era. With that, let's look at the first one. That is all data sources and computing services are considered resources. In olden days, only data stores were considered as resources. But today, the things have changed. There is no perimeter. There is no um, data hiding in the databases. Data is floating everywhere. As you can see here, data is everywhere. It is in the workload. It is flowing through our networks and devices, and it is being accessed by people. So everything, all data sources, including my laptop, laptop, if it is storing any data or it is transmitting any data, needs to be considered as a source of data. Second one, all communication is secured regardless of network location. So the perimeter defense is dead. It's no longer applicable. Every single communication needs to be secured, whether it is on box, off box, northwest, sorry, northwest traffic, east west traffic, doesn't matter. Everything needs to be secured. That is the second principle. Third principle is access to individual resources is granted on per session basis. Olden days, we used to have access to certain resources for years. There was no access revocation. I would get access to a resource forever. That will change. That has to change because everything is going to be dynamic going forward because there are no boundaries. I can be accessing any resource from my office laptop in my office network or I could be at home on an office VPN, or I could be on a home laptop, but accessing an office resource. It could be any of these. So the use cases have changed. There is no perimeter defense. So there is a must have per session based access. Next one, the fourth concept, which is again in and around the access to resources, it should be determined by the dynamic policy. What do I mean by dynamic policy? There should be a logical policy informants point and they, it should be context sensitive based on the client identity, based on the location and context of the specific identity. It could be device identity, it could be an individual identity, or it could be any other type of identity that we see today. That's the fourth principle. The fifth principle is the enterprise should monitor, measure the security posture of all its assets on a continuous basis. That is this ring that you see, visibility and analytics. The green ring around all the things, what it means is if you are an enterprise providing solution to your customers, you should provide visibility and analytics dynamically about your uh, assets um, security posture. So that is the expectation of zero trust. Next, the sixth and most important thing, which has changed the world, that is all resource authentication and authorization are dynamic and it should be enforced before the access is allowed. What it means is before somebody is allowed access, they should clear the authentication and authorization. So earlier days, it was not so. So you, you get access to the VPN or the network, then you can walk around it. Right, You can go to any resource, hop on from one system to an, another system, SSH from one, one uh, server to another server, go anywhere you want, walk around in any way. But that doesn't work. That doesn't fly with zero trust. It should be authorized by that specific resource that you're trying to access before it is allowed. So that is the expectation. That is going to change the way we do identity and, 
access. That is the uh, thing which is going to change the way we do authentication as, uh, as of now. Next one is enterprise should collect as much information as possible and also current state of all the resources and pro provide observability, provide visibility and improve the security posture. So it's like not one time done and dusted. It has to be continuously monitored, continuously done, which changes the dynamics of the way we do um, SOAR, the way we do SOC, everything changes because of this expectation. So that, co that can only happen with this black ring of automation and or orchestration that you see here. So what it means is we can no longer have silos where workload is managed by someone, network is somebody else's responsibility, people are somebody's responsibility, devices are somebody's responsibility, and data which is touching everything is somebody else's responsibility. So this disintegrated way of doing security will not work. Everything has to tie together. Everybody has to hold hands and do security for their systems. And data, which is shared across these things. For example, the data could be in the HR systems inside the company, and it can also be in Workday as well. That's a classic example. So Workday is accessible through internet. So these are the nuances that we need to look at. How we are going to protect data in this context, and what are the extra measures that we would like to take in this context? With that, I think I have given you enough, uh, you know, understanding of zero trust and AI and the importance in, in, in data protection. Now, let's see how we can apply this all together, how this all blends together and how we can protect this whole ecosystem. Now, the ecosystem of today is what you can see in the right hand side. And the data sub subjects that you see here are all of us. It's not just our customers who use our, uh, our solutions. It's not just our customers, it's all of us. Because the data is a new black, right? It's, it's being sold in the dark web. It's being sold everywhere. And just like water, we are, we are seeing regulations around this. Countries are coming up with their regulations. And in the United States, each state has its own regulation around data privacy and the rights of the people. Besides all this, privacy is a fundamental right of a human being. So we need to respect that. We need to look at that perspective, despite what other regulations say. If I do not want to share my data, it should be respected and I should have rights to protect my data. Giving this, um, you know, keeping these ethos in mind, let's, let us look at how things operate in all these different systems, because it's very important to understand that. What happens is the data is collected from multiple data subjects like, like us, guinea pigs like us, right? We have Alexa at home, we have everything um, everywhere on our phone and phone is just our phone data is enough for anybody to know our behaviors, our patterns, our spend patterns, our buying patterns and whatnot. That's a basic thing uh, I can tell you that the phone can give out tons of data about us than anything else. Now, let's say that information is connected from our smartphones and other things like the surveillance devices, CCTV cameras and other devices. Imagine the security devices can also be processing tons of sensitive data as well, right? So that is also important thing to remember. Now, all this is collected and it is fed to the intermediate devices like data controllers, processors, um, routers, gateways. And here, when the data transmission is happening, data aggregation and processing is happening, which is the lifeblood of all these AI systems. Right? So all this data aggregation is the gold that we are talking about, is the black we are talking about. So all this data aggregation is powerful. Let's say we get data of all our Indian citizens 
pan card data or you know it could be any anything right aadhar card data imagine what could be done with that we can find out what what we spend what where we spend not just that we'll get the the all the information about us is is very powerful data for people who are selling solutions people who are marketing things people who are building things so this is not just any information it's it's very powerful information about the spend patterns it can make or break companies right so that is the power of this data now let's look at the enterprise systems where we have data center servers and all the other things where lot of processing is happening lot of data mining is happening where you will see most of the llms coming into play so that is where all the large learning module uh, modules come into picture all the new algorithms that are built out that is where it is happening so imagine the magnitude of data imagine the power of the data how it can help the enterprises now what is our responsibility in this ecosystem and how we can apply zero trust privacy in this context so we need to ensure the right access to the right resources is available for the right people so this is the responsibility on our shoulders that the protections that we will be building is going to enable that now let's see how we can do that in order to do that we need to understand the importance on, of security and governance it cannot happen without security so that is the paramount thing in this ecosystem to protect anything so it cannot be ignored second bullet point is centralizing data governance as you can see data is managed by multiple departments in any company and one leak from one department can lead to disasters so centralizing the governance keeping the data um, protected at all times is paramount importance alleviating biases so now think of this magnitude of data going to all these ai systems will have certain biases which is a risk so that is something we should be understanding before making decisions if we are using ai based systems and making um, you know make our biased decisions we need to keep in mind that there are certain biases because your ai systems are only as good as its data and if the data is biased our decisions can go wrong so that is why humans should be at the center of making decisions in this ecosystem the fourth point is acknowledging and response responding to software sup supply chain risks everything that you see today are codeless everybody wants to be uh, you know they want to go for fast food the no code solutions are becoming very very popular what it means to company what it means to security people like we are going for a blindfold chess we are playing blindfold chess with people who are using our data i don't know how they are using their data so this is a huge risk which we need to acknowledge right we need to acknowledge that, to that and respond to that because if no code software is the decision by the company it's our responsibility to make the company understand that what are the risks that come with this it's very important this includes the open source software not just the third party software that we use next one is contending with ai hallucinations so if you have used chat gpt four out of five times it may be correct but the one out of five times it it hallows in it it throws crap like it it just throws some nonsensical data so and it, it is very easy to push the chat gpt to get into that situation it's very easy so what it means to us if you are using ai driven software ai hallucination can break your systems so we need to be contending that we need to be prepared if we are using ai based systems and if ai gets into this hallucination we should be ready to handle that risk last but not the least copyright laws 
So these are very, very important because it's very blurred at this point of time. We have very, very less oversight and regulations in this area. So we need to be careful about the copyright laws. And especially if we are handing over our data to third party, we should be very, very careful about all these legal aspects. All right, with that, I would like to thank you all for listening to this. And maybe I would, I would leave this uh, open for about five minutes for any questions. If you'd like to share any questions in the chat window, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Suraya. Thank you, everyone, for all the encouragement and all the emojis. Thank you all. Thank you, Palak. Thank you, Simran. A lot of applause, hearts. Thank you, people. All right. So if you would like to connect with me, please feel free to connect on LinkedIn. And if you want to discuss anything, any uh, further things on this topic, feel free to hit me up on the LinkedIn chat. I'll be happy to uh, talk to you. Thank you, Mamata, for, for the appreciation. Thank you for attending the session. All right, as I do not see any questions in the chat box, uh, I would like to thank you all for attending this session. Hope this session was useful. And if you want to further chat about this or, you know, explore any other topics of interest, please feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to talk to you. And also, I do consider mentoring some of the individuals who are interested in cyber security careers. So, I'll be happy to talk to you in the LinkedIn if you'd like to explore any of those. And I would like to thank Day of Security India for coming up with this initiative for the first time. And it's a huge, huge opportunity for all the women in India to get together and then learn from each other. So thank you for the organization, um, for organizing this session and helping all the women in India get together in this uh, initiative. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day ahead. Bye.